learn about culture, but you they have this cute little CQ culture quotient. I don't know if you remember the old IQ tests, intelligence quotient. They supposedly measured your level of intelligence. And then Daniel Goleman wrote a book about intelligence of emotions, emotional intelligence quotient, your EQ. And he said that that really helps you in a business or in life, that that is more important than your intelligence quotient, your ability to kind of manage emotions and not get really angry at work necessarily, unnecessary, you know, and, and so he writes about that. He's on LinkedIn. But when we had in education, they were really excited about learning about the EQ. And now they're talking about the CQ, the cultural intelligence quotient. It includes motivation and cognitive abilities to understand and adapt to every kind of situation, context, people, and patterns of interaction, kind of based on understanding that cultures are different. And they might not be being rude. It might be part of their culture that we don't, they don't that you don't understand yet. And so they say that you can increase your ability to understand others' cultures if you have drive, motivation to understand and interact with them, knowledge, how far your understanding about another culture might go in terms of religion, values, norms, language, strategy, ability to predict how the interaction should unfold, but also to be open to changing plans if it doesn't. So if you're going to go do a business trip to China because you have a sales pitch, they're saying, maybe be prepared for their expectations so you can predict how they might react if you were to look them in the eye. So have a strategy so you don't stare them in the eye. And then you can adapt if they seem friendly or more used to that. And action, capacity to adapt your own behavior to a particular situation by kind of drawing on a broad repertoire of listening, talking. These things can help you get a, get um, have better and effective communication regardless of culture. So they want to talk about the five different ways that cultures vary, five different dimensions. And I thought this was interesting. One or two of them I wouldn't have even thought of. And they thought of it, studied it, noticed it. One is individualism versus collectivism. It, uh, and they talk about that. Some cultures value being an individual, a rugged individual, being um, independent, while other cultures value being part of a group, a family or the whole town, the whole group is much more valued. And that's where you find your, your meaningful positions as part of that group. So cultures high in collectivism, high in group, value where they value being a collection, Pakistan or China, their identity uh, is tied more deeply to their groups, their families, what family they belong to, what clan, what group. And they have an example. This woman who wrote this book is named Julia Wood, but she said in those cultures, they introduce themselves with their last name first. I'm Wood Julia, because it's much more important to know what kind of what family they belong to than their individual first name. And here, what do we use? Our first names first. I'm Julia. I'm Julie Boswell. Because we think of ourselves often as individuals first. The second one, this is what I thought was interesting. Uncertainty avoidance. So, some cultures, people like to have everything spelled out very explicitly to avoid misunderstandings. But in other cultures, Hong Kong and Sweden, they list uncertainty is more tolerated. And I could see that could have a lot of different ramifications on time or expectations at work or who's supposed to do something. They might leave it more flexible and let you work it out. I'm not sure about my own. They didn't say where we are on the individualism and collectivism scale. Do you think people in the US are more, uh, that we're more a country that values individualism or collectivism? I feel like it's both, but like I, when it comes to like 
like names and stuff like that once you're at like a doctor's office like I introduced myself last name first name because of like their alphabetical order like their paperwork and stuff like that but oh. I feel like as individual people I feel like it's definitely more like individualism yeah Monique you're nodding what do you say I totally agree with her. I just feel like it's just more individualism than collectivism. Yeah, I agree too. You know, I know in German language, they capitalize the word for you and they make the word for I small. But in English, which one do we capitalize? Uh, well, I capitalize the I. I. I, yeah. But the word for you is little. So it. It, that, uh, to me, that always struck me as maybe we value the I very much. We like to be independent, and we talk about that a lot. But we also are part of a team. We have the United States, and we value teamwork, and we value sports that have teams. So I think we might be in the middle I, a little bit, like Alana was saying, a little bit. We're more on the individual side, but maybe we value that teamwork, that unity a little bit too, being part of a group. And the uncertainty avoidance, I don't know. What about this one? Power distance. The third dimension of cultural values is power distance. And this means, what's the difference between the boss of the company and the workers in power? Would they call them by their title? Would they ever approach them? Would they ever see them? Would they be located in the same spot? And also, how is that power passed down? In some cultures, for example, India and China, the distance between high power and low power is great. And it's often inherited. Like royalty, there's a queen, maybe, and then there are the rest of us who aren't queens. <laughs> or cultures where power distance is small, like New Zealand, Norway, Denmark, people assume that everybody who's in power earned it. And everybody's seen as more on the same level. They don't use titles as often. They're much more apt to use first names. They're not apt to wear like suits for the boss and um, everyday clothes for the rest of us. Everybody just kind of wears everyday clothes. So there's much less emphasis on showing that you're in power or being di so far above the others. Everybody's kind of the same. Just somebody happens to have that job. So there's, power distance. What do you think we are here? Do we, do we have a huge power distance or do we have a small one? In the United States, small one. I, I, I say small one. You say small one? Yeah. We do sometimes call our bosses by the first names. We call our teachers sometimes by the first names. We call um, older people even by their first names, although not all of us do that. That side note. I think maybe like maybe back in like the 30s, 40s, 50s, it was different. But now mm -hmm. you don't have people respecting people, calling them, you know, Mr. or Mrs. or, you know, people do go and call people, you know, by their name. It's not how it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think the reason though is because of all the changes with like having to constantly. It's the generation. Just like consent and just like being everybody being like weary and like on edge at work. That's like, I want everybody to feel as comfortable as they can. So please don't call me Mr. or Mrs. This, like call me Brian. You know, if you need anything, come to my office. We're all okay here. Like, this is safe. So I think it's just more of a place of like trying to feel connected and on the same level as everybody rather than making people feel like they're below somebody else. Yeah, but think about it, though. Like, if, if we were, like, in the 40s and 50s and, and say a guy, we work for a guy in an office and they said, oh, call, call me Brian, then that means he had interest in you, you know? It was more of a flirty thing. Yeah. I wonder if it's confusing for people who come from other cultures when they see we all talk on the first name, if they think, well, I can't tell who's in charge. Or... Everybody must be friends with the boss. You know, they're all using the first names. I wonder if it confuses people from other cultures. I'm thinking about also like, doesn't Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg always wear turtlenecks or hoodies? He's always trying to look like one of the guys, even though he's a billionaire who runs a giant, giant multinational corporation. He's just one of the guys. Do you remember that? Um, the Apple guy, 
Steve Jobs, he always used to show up in a black turtleneck. Never a suit, never a tie. Just a turtleneck, always a black turtleneck. He was just out for an afternoon stroll and hop, hopped in the business meeting. It was kind of like, he's just, he's just here, one of the guys. I don't know, was that, he was trying to show that he was one of the guys? It's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I thought that discussion that you guys were having was very profitable. Cultural differences in power relationships may lead to misunderstandings. A Ugandan immigrant to the United States interrupted the relatively casual and egalitarian equal relationships between professors and students as rudeness. The immigrant commented, the students eat, they drink in class, they talk back to professors. This is all very unacceptable in, in Uganda. And then they went further and said, no wonder Americans are losing their jobs to outsources because they're not respectful to bosses. So it could be perceived in other cultures that we're not showing proper respect. This is interesting, and I think these are traditional terms on page 192, masculinity and femininity, because they're culturally defined. So they could vary in different cultures, and they're varying from time to time. Like we were talking about yesterday, now more businesses are offering patern paternity leave because we're allowing men to be more involved in the raising of the children. We're making room for that in our culture. We're not defining masculinity as not being with the children. We're letting it change a little bit. But this fourth dimension of cultural variation is the definition in the culture of masculinity and femininity. It kind of talks about the, how far the culture values aggressiveness, aggression, competitiveness, looking out for yourself, dominating others, um, versus gentleness, cooperation, taking care of each other, living in harmony with the natural world. So one of those sets of is, is seen as more masculine often. And in culture that are kind of higher in those values, like Japan and Germany, their, their men tend to be more, more competitive and more aggressive. Now, in highly masculine culture, women may also be competitive and assertive, but it says that generally they're less so than men. Do you think that we're a culture that um, values, it's hard to say, because it, it's probably from family to family and person to person, but does our culture value masculinity, more aggressiveness, competitiveness more, or do they value getting along, cooperating more? They want to, uh, to get along, but they're more competitive. You know, in the they 60s. That's not really the case. Yeah. In the 60s, they um, decided that some of our competitive games were too rough and too competitive. We had been in that Vietnam War for a long time, and people were looking for ways to um, maybe change the culture from valuing competitiveness and aggression. And so they started games where everybody played on the same side new games they called them and that maybe you saw they had a giant giant ball called an earth ball and the teams the kids would push it all around and they'd have to work as teams to win but it wasn't competitive it was just kind of individual and nobody plays those games anymore so they tried a little bit something new because a lot of the games we watch on tv are very competitive so we seem to value that in a way I don't know if I told you, but in, in teaching, when I was um, learning how to teach um, not college students, high school students, they said that 20% of American kids value competition as a motivator. 20% value time alone, 20% value time with friends, 20% value out, um, <coughs> recognition from an authority figure, like being on the dean's list, being valedictorian, getting an A and 20% roughly valued uh, prizes. The goods, not the glory. I don't care about the glory, give me the goods, I want the pizza party. So I don't know if those numbers hold up when we grow up, but that means that there may be 20% of us at least who value competitiveness. And I do hear people say, I don't like to give a participation trophy to every child. I want the, only the ones who win through competition to get the trophy. Have you heard that argument, that discussion? It's something I think we think about. Because on the other hand, we want, our, we want our kids to work as teams and we want to be able to work in work groups and build a cohesive society. But we think that competition sometimes brings us um, better ideas. 
who competes in the workplace brings us the best idea. If you let Burger King and McDonald's compete for your business, McDonald's will come up with the Travis Scott meal. And what does Burger King have? No Travis Scott meal. Haven't had it, but I hear it's very intriguing. Barbecue sauce on French fries? Hmm. Who doesn't do that though? Yeah, it was a genius <laughs> idea, wasn't it? They already had the stuff. People already had done it. And then somebody said, Travis Scott, Travis, is his name Travis Scott? Travis Scott yeah. does this. Yeah. I had a moment where I was like, wait, I know a couple of Travises. Is it Travis Scott? Okay. So masculinity versus femininity kind of. I don't know where we fit. I think you could make a case where somewhere in there in the middle or maybe one one side. Maybe we val maybe we fluctuate. This one I think is interesting as I grow older. <clears throat> especially long-term orientation versus short-term orient orientation. This wasn't included in the guy who did this study's original work, but he added it later when he realized that cultures do vary in how long-term their orientations are. So long-term short-term orientation kind of refers to the extent to which members of a culture think about and um, long-term versus short-term planning. I, I was talking to my dad about a, um, an artist in Spain, his name was Goya, and he worked on a church called the Holy Family Church. In Spanish, it's called uh, La Sagrada Familia. Famili Familia? Fami Somebody help me. <laughs> anyway, it's a Spanish church. They've been building it for 100 years. That's long-term commitment, right? That's a society who says, we have a long-term goal, we're gonna get there. And you see that in some cathedrals in Europe where the culture had a long-term vision. They knew they started it and the people who worked on it at first might not finish it, but they were gonna get there. And so they had a long-term commitment. Um, in cultures that seem to value long-term, they seem to value their older people a little bit more and their culture shows it in short term where they want short term results they value things that are immediate they tend to value youth a little bit and don't have much respect for their elders or ancestors they say germany and australia might be on that end i don't know where we are i don't think we're where we value our old our older people or have long term plannings we're such a young country for one thing, we haven't seen what we can do in 100 years. We've only been here two sets of those. Do you think that we're in the middle? Or do you think that we're a value short-term, short-term right away visions? I want things right now. I like fast food. I, I want to turn on the TV and if I have to wait till it warms up, I'm pretty annoyed because I want it now. I want to order Amazon and I don't want it to come in the week. I don't want it to come today. I want it now. Amazon Prime, I want it now. <laughs> There's a guy on TV, Ronnie Chung, and he says, when he came here from Singapore, he said, everything is too quick. I want Amazon Prime now. Put it in my hand. Break into my house and put it in my hand as I'm ordering it. I want it now. And he said, and they do. They, they're willing to bring things faster and faster because we want them that way. I, I never thought about it about that as connected to how we might value our older people. But I wonder, it kind of makes that connection here. So those are the five, individualism versus collectivism, uncertainty avoidance, power distance, masculinity, femininity kind of gradient, and long-term, short-term orientation. That is kind of the five areas that you can look at countries and cultures. However, cultures are dynamic. That means they move, they change. They adapt, they roll with it. And there are three different things that kind of affect that. One is invention. When they invent things, a culture might change because of an invention. And they list things like a pacemaker, how that was life-changing. A lot of people who thought they were gonna die of a heart attack had a pacemaker and kept on living. Made a huge difference for them, but for their families and for their culture too. Can you think, they have the wheel, obviously, that's a big cultural changing invention. Anybody want to throw out another one that you think is really good? Uh, an invention that changed the culture? One or two in your lifetimes, perhaps. 
I'm so old. I look at you and I think, were they around when that was invented? Were they? Okay, so the cell phone was a touch screen because when I was growing up, there were only beepers and, and not touch screens. <laughs> I love how you said that, like that was the olden days because I was thinking when I was growing up, we didn't even have cell phones with touch no, screens. We didn't have yes. color TV. Yeah, we didn't either. And then you had to walk over to the TV to turn it on. Yeah. Yeah. It was hard. It was so hard. So with the struggles girl, I know when the kids lose the, re lose the remote, they're like, I'm like, why don't you have the TV on? These children are running rampant. And they're like, we can't find their own. I'm like, it's amazing that the button doesn't work on the TV then. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm not going to tell you that I do that too. But maybe oh, I do. <laughs> Occasionally, I'll just watch whatever's on because I can't find the remote. So I'm just sitting there. I'll just watch this. It's okay. It's okay. So they're dynamic. I was thinking of one. The cell phone was brilliant, whoever invented that. Computers themselves were pretty impressive, pretty impressive. They've changed things tremendously. Um, oh, I think grocery stores are crazy too. And now Giant Eagle, you have this like handheld thing where you pick it up and you can walk around and scan your groceries and put them in your cart. And then all you have to do at the end is pay. So like as you're shopping, you're scanning with a little remote and then all you do at the end is pay and you leave. Is how would they right? know, like, how would they not know that you're not scanning stuff, though? Like, that's what happened at Walmart. They were supposed to take out the self-checking because too many people were stealing things, but then they ended up having it, and now they're supposed to get rid of all the cashiers eventually, and it's going to be nothing but self-checkout. <sighs> yeah. I, I wonder it's... how they get away with that. You can't trust everybody, but I think you have to have a little bit of faith. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The I Apple don't know, store. Not these I, days. <laughs> I'd heard you could do that at the Apple store. That you just walk in and show your, you know, your phone. It just notices and you touch stuff to your phone and you walk out and it just takes it out of your um, bill, oh, out of crazy. your bank account. You don't even have to ring it up. That's pretty fast. Those are pretty interesting. I I always think of the Hoyer lift. I don't know if you've ever seen that for um, lifting people who can't stand up on their own. Um, when my grandma was very yeah. sick, she had trouble standing and my mom was helping her for a long time. And my grandma was, um, a heavy little lady. She was a, not very tall, but she was a little bit heavy. And, um, my mom had trouble getting her to stand, you know, safely. And it became harder and harder to get her to stand and move and help her get where she needed to go. And then they got this Hoyer lift. It's hydraulic. She would sit on this, um, canvas and it had hooks, you would hook it to um, chains and it would lift her in a swing that was canvas on the bottom. And then you could lift her from one chair to another chair, like a wheelchair and move her. So you didn't have to lift them. And the, it's hydraulic, it was one button, you push it. And suddenly my grandma's just rising up in the air, sitting in this little swinging chair. And then my mom could push it down the hall and my grandma could get out of the chair. It was life-changing. It meant we could keep her home. It was really good. Hoyer Lift was life-changing for us. Do you guys think of any more technology? So that changes the culture, right? It, ch it means you can keep family home with you longer. You can shop without having to spend as much time, so you can spend more time at home. This is really good. So invention is one thing that changes culture. I think this Zoom has changed culture. My dad is 85 years old and he can Zoom now. So he can get out and join us in meetings even though he's hunkered down from the virus. A second source um, of cultural change is diffusion. Where you just kind of, it floats, it, the two cultures con connect and certain parts of one culture get into the next, like, like a diffuser um, transmits scent and it goes through the air, different elements of the culture. And I was thinking foods, music, dances, um, language. For a while there was that feng shui idea. People were decorating their homes and trying to make it harmonious according to feng shui. How many people eat Italian food or Taco Bell or Chinese food, we, we like the food. Anybody listen to K-pop? K-pop, nope. 
that was going to be my example of music coming in, music coming in. How about, wait a minute, what's it called? Reggaeton. Is that music that anybody listens to? Spanish, Spanish and, and. Yeah, I listen to that. <laughs> yeah. And that came from, did that come from Jamaica? It's kind of reggae influenced music that's been adapted more to Spanish language. Am I right? Maybe not. She'll come and she'll tell us. Here's the third one. And I want you to realize that uh, this one is a, like a Cuban and um, type of music. You know what I mean? Is it? Yeah, I think so. Right. Like Cuban, Puerto Rican. That's what I think. I'm not too mm -hmm. for sure. I got to look into that, but that's where I like, I hear the similarities in the music. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. See, it's, it's helpful to have people here who can help us understand things better. So the first thing that changes culture is invention. And we talked about tools. I forgot to mention the other thing can be ideas. Uh, for example, democracy. The US is a democracy and we influenced France. They got the idea of starting a democracy shortly after our democracy was founded. We, you know, we started it and we probably based it on earlier democracies. Greece <coughs> experimented with a form of democracy um, long, long ago. And now many countries have democracies because the ideas spread. So culture kind of spreads. And it spreads with the idea of invention like um, environmental responsibility is another one that's kind of spreading and transforming how we kind of see our relationships with other countries and within our countries or our own cultures. So we have inventions and then we have diffusion. Sometimes we get not just, not just cultural things, but ideas, best practices. For a while, we were all in education thinking about teaching math the way they teach it in Japan because Japan's math scores were so far ahead than American students' math scores. So we thought, well, let's figure out how they teach it and let's try that. So sometimes it's just ideas that we take, not just um, music or, or food or words. Here's the third one. This is another way cultures change, calamity. And they say it may involve disasters such as hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, and plagues. And we're kind of, I think that's interesting. They wrote that when this book was written, not this year, and we're kind of in the midst of a plague. And I know that hurricanes can affect culture. Um, people after a hurricane in Katrina in New, New Orleans, many of them left and some of them came to Cleveland. So their world has probably changed a lot. The culture in New Orleans is very different than here. We don't do a lot for, um, what's that, what's that? February, Mardi Gras, we don't do a lot. They might be disappointed. We don't have the same food. We don't have the same languages, Cajun. And has anybody, anybody been to New Orleans? Anybody celebrate Mardi Gras up here? See what I mean? They must be missing out. Here's something that I think is key. We're gonna move on. Multiple social communities coexist within a single culture. So even though the culture is big, there are lots of other cultures that make it up. Co-cultures, um, social communities or co-cultures are groups of people who live within the, what's called the dominant culture, just the bigger culture. For example, immigrants may identify both with the culture, the larger dominant culture of the country that they've moved to and the culture of their homeland. They can have both a foot in both cultures. And you can see you belong to a lot of different cultures. You belong to your family culture, your work culture, your um, country culture, maybe your homeland culture, a church culture or mosque or synagogue culture. So it says social communities are distinct from the dominant culture. They're not the same, but they're part of it. And, and they wanted to make that point that we're not all exactly the same, that there are many different cultures that make up most larger cultures. Um, and then <clears throat> I wanted to talk briefly about communication style as it relates to culture. And they use these words on page 194. One is high context communication style and one is low context communication style. High context 
communication style means that for me to talk to you, I need to have a lot of context about you, how your day's going, how your mom feels, how your kids are doing in school. I need to have all the information so that I feel that I can communicate with you well. Um, and in low context communication style, it's direct and to the point. Don't need a lot of context. And so if you're in a low context communication culture where you just want the details, which America seems to be, when you get a business letter, you're not used to your bank inquiring about your family. You're not used to your insurance agency wishing you happy holidays and asking you personal questions and making a lot of small talk. But in other cultures, that is seen as necessary. Um, and if you were to just jump right into the business part of it, it's seen as not taking time to connect and make the relationship. In Japan, for example, if you were to go to a business meeting and just jump right in and present your idea without speaking to everybody and making these kind of connections and inquiring and, and fostering these relationships, they're very put off by it because they are not used to such a low context communication style. Um, gender as a social community. They say they studied a lot of different social communities and one that they've studied a lot because it's easy, I guess, is gender because there are so many, 51% women, 50% men, they could find these social groups. But they talk about differences in communication and you may have noticed this or you may have heard articles about this, but in our culture, for example, women are often cultured to not be as direct to not say do this, but to say, I think we might want to consider doing this, putting layers between it before you come right out. Sometimes we present things as questions. Do you think we ought to go get dinner? When what we really mean is let's go get dinner. But that's kind of how sometimes women have been cultured to speak and women who break those rules are seen as more brusque, more abrupt more direct, bossy, <clears throat> for good or for bad. And this kind of has an effect in the workplace. There are workshops on how to talk to your boss, how to get your ideas out there, how to ask for promotions and raises. Because when we ask in our softer way, sometimes it's not a good negotiating strategy. So there are workshops, know your value, there are books, there are websites helping us to change the way that we communicate in the workplace if we have been cultured to speak more um, indirectly. Um, there's another generalization that they make, but they say in gender, women um, tend to talk more about relationships, whereas men are discouraged from talking about relationships and so um, they have this example, the complication in communication between women and men occurs when a woman says, let's talk about us, because the men perhaps haven't been cultured to feel comfortable doing that, and they think that might be too much. <clears throat> Other social communities include social class. And they communicate differently within social classes. And I think this is hard for us as Americans because we often don't consider class. We, we do value being equal. And so often we don't even like to think about that we do have social classes. But what they say is um, they've, they've noticed that um, working class people tend to stay closer and rely on extended family more and that affects their conversation and their communication patterns. And then they say that men who work in working class jobs also tend to see physical strength and practical skills as more central to masculinity than upper, upper or middle class men. And you can see that because that's probably valued in their workplace, being physically strong. So of course they would value it more. They talk about different um, communication styles or patterns based on race or ethnicity. And then they give this example, but they want to say, and I think this is worth pointing out, notice that in discussing social communities, 
and their communication patterns, she uses qualifying words, most, not all, some. Occasionally they tend, because you can't say that everybody does this all the time. That's really not very helpful or it's not accurate. And it can also be kind of a form of stereotyping. Um, here, I, I thought this was interesting. This is, we're closing in on it. We don't have very much time, but we are almost there. Communication expresses culture and it sustains culture. It reflects cultural values and it shapes them. So you see people changing language sometimes because they want to change the way people think about um, a certain concept. And then, and then they give some examples here. In English, we don't have as many words to describe all of our relations. We just say cousin. But many Asian language include numerous words to describe specific relationships. They have a word for my grandmother's brother. They have a word for my father's uncle. So they have more specific words. We just kind of have to use two words pieced together because they seem to value kinship more and they have therefore developed words that describe kinship. And then they talk about words that they use for youthful, for older, older. I am old enough to deserve respect, they'll say. I, I'll be 60 tomorrow is a saying in Japan. That means I'm gonna be old, respect me. Because they value older elders more than some cultures. And then they contrast those type of sayings, I'll be 60 tomorrow, as opposed to words for youthfulness that we have young in spirit, fresh, young, contrasting with our words for old, has been outdated, old fashioned, over the hill. And I never thought about it, but those aren't very nice words. And they mean old, over the hill, old fashioned, outdated. So our language might shape a little bit of our value or maybe it just reflects it. But they suggest that when you learn a language, you also learn the values of that culture whether you're thinking about it or not, if those are the only words you have to describe old, then maybe you don't pick up a great feeling about older, older members of your community. They say though, in the process of communicating, we learn culture. And I wanted to look at these proverbs on the bottom of page 198. Does somebody wanna read the first one? They're bullet pointed, there are four of them. And they kind of, they're using these to say that sometimes you can tell from the Proverbs what the cultural values are, from things that they often say in common language that show a cultural value. For example, it is the nail that sticks out that gets hammered down. This is a Japanese saying, and they think that it reflects the idea that a person shouldn't stand out from the others. If you stand out too much, You'll get hammered down. You work better if everybody's conforming. Here's one. No need to know the person, only the family. This is a Chinese maxim, a Chinese axiom. And they say it reflects the belief that individuals are less important than the family. The group membership is more important. Here's one. I love this one. A zebra does not despise its stripes. Among the Maasai people of Africa, um, this saying encourages acceptance of things and of oneself as they are. Well, I have stripes. Great. I would love to have stripes. I think zebras are beautiful, but that's why I didn't understand that. A zebra does not despise its stripes. And here's, here are two that they've taken from African sayings. The child has no owner, which means everybody has a hand in raising the child or it takes a whole village to raise a child, which I think I've heard many times. These kind of express the cultural belief that the children belong to the whole community and everybody has a hand in raising them or a responsibility to them. Is that the case here? Do we see that here? To a certain degree, we have family members watch our children raise them. Do you think it's changing? Would you correct someone else's child? If you knew them, would you correct someone else's child? 
<laughs> Monique's like, no, I would not. Depending, depending on the correction and how you say it. I'll yeah, it's it's interesting. How far does that go if we're all raising each other's children? Are we allowed to correct someone else's child? Maybe if we're in the family? Not or even. Friend, I don't know. Or somebody or a friend or somebody bring their kid over like to my house and then their kid is just over here jumping and bouncing off the walls. I probably let, or I could let her know or I'm just let the kid know too, but it's a way to say it. I wouldn't just come off just being rude. I will come off as being parent on how I correct my daughter. Yeah, it has to be a little... Way, I can say it's a way how to do it. So I yeah. would... Yeah, I agree with mommy. I've had to do that with the, the neighbor kid that comes over like every day, especially in the summer. He's doing things that I wouldn't let the other kids do. And I'm like, okay, now you need to stop <laughs> or you need to go home. So <laughs> my kids is like, they're instantly in trouble. So it's like, it's just how you present it to them. The other thing with that too, is I don't think I would because I don't have kids. So I have like no... I, and I wouldn't even know what to say, you know, <laughs> I don't have kids, so I can't tell your kids what to do or anything, you know. Uh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. In my family, you can't correct someone else's child. You can just express concern that they might hurt themselves. Oh, honey, jumping on the couch is not safe. I'm, I'm afraid you'll fall. And if you say that loudly enough, their mother might hear you and come and make them stop. That's all we're allowed to do. So it varies a little bit, huh? It's interesting. Interesting. I, I like that idea. <sighs> Digital media and social media has made it possible to connect with everybody. But there is a little bit of a dark side related to cultures. They say that digital media, the virtual world, has also created a home for some hate groups. And they're working in the opposite direction. They're not trying to build cultural bridges. They're trying to put up cultural barriers to understanding. And so there's a two kind of pronged, you know, there, there, there's a good side to digital media, social media, and then there's something to be a little wary of. They give us guidelines for <clears throat> improving communication between cultures and social communities. We have three minutes, so let me tell you what they are. There are three of them, five of them, <clears throat> four of them, five of them. They say rec re resist ethnocentric bias. And sometimes we don't realize that we grew up this way. It seems right to us, so we judge other things as not right when they might be different, not just wrong. They're just different. But they want to point out it's, it's a temptation sometimes to think the way we do things is the right way. So others might be doing it wrong. And they're saying, resist that bias of ethnocentricity. Just realize it's probably just different. Ethnocentrism is the use of one's own culture and practices as a standard. Everybody should do what we do because we do it right. See what I mean? It doesn't really fit. Okay, here's what they want to say. Recognize that interacting with people and with diverse people is a process. We don't suddenly learn everything about every single person and make every interaction perfect. It's a process, but you can do things by um, knowing the sort of places that people, the ways people react. Sometimes when people are exposed to diversity, they throw up resistance. That's when they attack the cultural practices of others or think theirs are the most important or the most superior. Um, they may not be aware that they're using their own culture as a gauge when just because they grew up and it doesn't mean it's inherently any better than anybody else's, or they may be aware. Re resistance can be kind of hard. It can be, it can, it can look like opposition. The second thing is tolerance. Some people tolerate, they don't understand, they don't like perhaps, differences, but they tolerate them. And they, um, that's the first step. They accept difference, even though they may not understand or approve of it. Judgment still exists, but it's not actively being forced on others. They're not telling them you're wrong. They're just tolerating. The third is understanding. This is where um, 
people can respond growing out of cultural relativism where they understand that things are different in different cultures and they have their reasons and they're usually um, the right thing for that culture. So you understand. This is a person um, who understands about eye contact might notice that a Japanese person is not holding eye contact in a conversation, but they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't assume that they're trying to hide something or they're ashamed. They would just try to learn, well, that's different. I wonder why they do that and try to learn why. Why do they do it differently? And then they have respect. That's moving beyond judgment and beginning to understand the cultural basis for the practices. Why do they do that? Um, respect allows us to acknowledge differences, but still, you know, be anchored in our own cultural values. You can respect others and still practice your own. There's no problem there. And then there is another response where some people participate in another culture. They may have friends in that culture. They may just want to learn about it. They may marry into that culture. They may learn the language. They may learn the food. They may learn the values. They develop new skills. They participate in that. So there's a scale of responses and they range, it ranges from resistance, which is very negative, tolerance, understanding, respect, all the way up to participation. And it says in the course of our lives, many of us move in and out of various responses as we interact with people from multiple cultures and social communities. And sometimes our responses change. We grow, we learn. That is the end of it. Thank you so much. You have a test, a quiz today. It has 25 questions. I think you have one try, but you have the page numbers on there. I'm going to leave it open till Sunday at midnight. Okay, so you have one try, but you have page numbers and you have time until Sunday at midnight. You also have a reflection that you're gonna write and that's on Moodle as well. If you have any questions or problems, let me know. You've been an amazing bunch. If you were all here in person, I would give you three roses, not four. Thanks for coming. Good luck on the quiz. Good luck on the reflection. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank let you. me know if you let me know if you need anything. Okay. Adios. Au revoir. Mrs. Boswell. Yes. Um, on Monday, um, my daughter's switching to a different class through virtual. Um,